Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. It's good to see you. I received an Atari 130XC in the mail from Paul, one of the subscribers of the channel. And it needs some TLC, so I figured, why not make a video while I'm doing the repair? But I also want to let you know that I received some goodies in the mail from another one of the viewers who wishes to remain anonymous at this point. Um, but I wanted to show you that real quick, what I received. So I got a package in the mail from one of the viewers. He is actually the same viewer that donated the 520ST. So inside this box, we've got an Atari 850 serial interface, which we'll talk about in a future video. This was used to connect multiple external serial devices to your Atari. We also received a couple of power supplies. Not too exciting, but we're going to go ahead and test them and see if they work. We might be able to use them for something. And inside the bigger box, we've got an Atari 800 computer. Now, as a kid, I never owned an Atari 800 computer, but I did learn on the Atari 800 computer in my high school. And this was the first introduction I had to Atari computers. At the time, I was working on the Apple II. And um, once I saw the Atari 800 in the school's library and saw what some of the other kids were doing with it, I was, I was immediately attracted to it. So this one seems to be in decent shape. It's a little dusty, a little dirty, nothing we can't clean up. But this will be a good video for those who are not familiar with the Atari 800. And I know there's lots of videos out there about the Atari 800, but we'll go through it in our own special way and we'll learn some of the things about it that um, can be done with it. It's, it's just as good as the newer 800 XLs and the 600 XLs. Um, it's built like a tank, that's for sure. You can see here in the back, it's got the original composite RF cable meant to be designed to connect to the RF modulator. I've also been working on the third part of the 520ST reverberation series, where we're going to upgrade the toss on the ROMs for the 520ST. And we're also going to be attaching a flash drive solution for reading and writing the Atari disk images. So stay tuned for that as well. Also, I want you to go to Paul's blog or his website. It's called GoTo10 Retro Computing. You can receive a weekly newsletter from him where he discusses all kinds of Atari topics from back in the day, programming articles, magazine articles, and just a lot of good content for those of us who love our 8-bit Atari computers, I'll provide a link in the description where you can subscribe. In the meantime, let's get on with the video and see what we can do for Paul's 130XE. Stick around, don't go anywhere. Hey, what's up guys? I was sent an Atari 130XE computer from one of the viewers of the channel, Paul, and he described to me that the computer did not show any color. It just shows a gray background and gray for all the colors. So let's take a quick look at it and see what's going on. Now you can see here from the video on your side, it may look like there is a little bit of bluish color to the screen, but in reality, it's just gray. The camera doesn't do the justice that's needed. And when we go into self test here, you can see if you're familiar with the self test screen of the Atari that these colors have green and yellow and blue, and we're not seeing any of those colors here. Uh, it just looks solid gray. So as a matter of fact, I'll show you what uh, a good working Atari 130XE should look like on this test screen. You can see here the blue background and the green bars that showed the good and the bad RAM. So we know we have a problem. So let's go ahead and take the 130XE apart and I have a suspicion that the R138 resistor, or excuse me, resistor 38, which is a 500K potentiometer on the main board, 
is probably bad or is worn out. Um, I think Paul had told me in the email that he sent to me that he tried to adjust that color using that potentiometer, but either he didn't have good results or he didn't get any results. So let's go ahead and take the 130XE apart and see if we can figure out. Here you can see the keyboard and the RF shielding. Looks like this is a pretty fairly stock Atari being that it has those components in it. I know a lot of um, computer or Atari computer home techies like to remove that RF shield. And in reality, you don't need that RF shield. That was put there back in the day for when we had televisions with RF modulators and this RF shielding would prevent any um, radio frequencies or you know, static from being generated from the computer showing up on the TV. So here we've got the 130XE main motherboard. And you can see here the potentiometer, which is a variable resistor, R38. It looks like it's been kind of damaged a little bit, probably from many adjustments in the past or somebody going in there with the wrong size screwdriver and trying to make the adjustment on it. So. I have a sneaky suspicion that that is going to be the problem and we're gonna end up needing to replace it. So why don't we go ahead and try to make some adjustments in the meantime and see if we get anywhere with adjusting the color. You can see here closely, if you look real closely, that center hole, it's normally set up for a screwdriver to turn it, but it looks like it's been bent and rounded out. Now, on the stock computer, you can access this from the bottom of the case without actually having to take it apart. So probably somebody's been in there over time and kind of rounded it out. So that's probably going to make it difficult to make the adjustment. But in any event, let's go ahead and plug the computer in and see if we can adjust that, that resistor R38 and make any improvements to the computer. So here we are, got the gray screen. I'm gonna go ahead and try and turn this potentiometer with the screwdriver and see if I can get any better results. Now you can see as soon as I touched that thing, the screen did change to a reddish, purplish, violet color and as as I'm trying to turn that potentiometer, it's number one, it's very hard to turn it. It almost looks like it's stuck, um, but I'm not getting any adjustment on the screen. I'm not getting any type of, of change. Well, maybe I'm getting a very small change, but I'm not getting any change that I need. So I think step one is gonna be to replace that potentiometer. It may solve the problem altogether, it may not. We might have some more issues, but we won't know until we actually replace that component and see where it gets us. So let's go ahead and complete the disassembly of the 130XE by removing the motherboard from the chassis. There's a few Phillips head screws that we've got to take out and then we'll be able to examine the board directly much closer. Make sure you keep the screws from the motherboard separate from the screws um, from the outside case. They're a little smaller, so just keep the sizes together so you don't mix them up. So now that we've got the motherboard out, let's take the lower half of the RF shield. Yes, there's a piece of RF shielding below the motherboard as well. So now we can take a good look at the circuit board. And from the rear, it almost seems like someone has been in here before and tried to touch up the solder joints on this. You can see that the board's been heated up. Uh, from the brown resin, the solder resin. You can also see the balls of the solder are quite enlarged. And these connections over here by the RF modulator looks like they've been touched up as well. 
maybe somebody was trying to do a repair on this before and they thought maybe there were some cold solder joints and that by touching up the solder joints it would correct the problem. But here's our R38. So we're going to go ahead and take that out and replace it with another one that I've ordered. Now I wasn't able to find an exact replacement for this, but I found one that is similar in spec, spec, but it has a different footprint to it. And I'll show you that in a second. But I went ahead and removed R38. I didn't want to bore you with the desoldering technique. There's plenty of YouTube videos out there where you can watch people desolder things. But you can see there's three legs for the potentiometer. And here's a good look at it from the front, R38. Be careful when you're desoldering these components. These old motherboards are very frail and the tracings are very thin. You can see here at the back where I've taken all the solder out. This one was the hardest to get out. It had some kind of a resin or epoxy on top of it. I'm not sure if that was from the factory or if it was put after the fact. Here's a look at the new potentiometer. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's a look at the old potentiometer. You can see it's pretty beat up and mangled. This was definitely damaged from some rough adjustments, to say the least. More than likely someone inserting the wrong size screwdriver in there and rounding out the, um, the adjustment wheel. All right, so let's take a look at these 500K potentiometers that I ordered. I got these through the mail. Jamico is where I ordered them from. And they're not exactly the same form size as the original, but they do have the same specs, 500K. I think they're half a watt or a watt. Now, the only problem this is gonna pose is the leg spacing is a little different, but I'll show you how we take care of that in just a second. Let's go ahead and pull out our multimeter and just check how this works for those who are maybe new to electronics who are not familiar with a potentiometer it's basically a variable resistor which means you can tune the resistance the amount of resistance that it gives to current in a circuit so this is 500,000 ohms half a mega ohm so we're going to put our meter on resistance or ohms I'm going to connect the meter to two of the legs and then I'm going to turn the dial on the top of the potentiometer and you'll see the resistance. Right now it's reading 0.5 mega ohms, which is 500K roughly. And you'll see as I turn the knob on the top, you'll see the resistance go down and up. You can see it going down 400K, 300K, 200K, 198K, and then bringing it back up. So this is kind of like how you adjust the potentiometer with the screwdriver and this will tune the color circuit which produces the NTSC signal on the Atari. So now that we know that this new potentiometer works, let's go ahead and get it on the board. So I'm going to go ahead and orient it like the other one. The the, the way the potentiometers are normally oriented is they've got three legs and they've got two legs that are closer together than the third leg. And as you can see here, the two legs fit in the top two holes on the PCB, but the third leg, since this is a smaller profile, it won't quite reach over to that third leg. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm just going to have to extend that leg and I'll show you how I do that in a second. It's, it's okay if you don't use the exact part, as long as the part that you're using is within the same spec as the original part. Sometimes the form factor, you've got to work with it a little bit, being that, you know, these computers are over 40 years old and you're not always going to get the exact part. So the first thing I'll do is I'll go ahead and solder the two legs that do fit inside the board and get those secure. doesn't take a lot of solder here it's just a couple dabs get the legs attached all 
I've got my soldering iron at about 800 watts to make sure that that solder melts through the hole all the way on both sides of the PCB. Now for this third leg, I'm going to extend it just a few millimeters so that it will reach the hole and go through. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to take an actual resistor, another component, and I'm going to sacrifice some of the lead on it. You can see here I've got a list resistor with quite long leads, so I'm just going to take a piece of that resistor and I'm going to insert that in the third hole, solder it to the board, and then I'll connect the two legs together to make for one connection. Now I know some of you are probably going to comment saying that, well, now we can't adjust the NTSC uh, potentiometer from the bottom of the computer. That's true. But in light of getting this thing working and repairing it and not having the original part, I think it's a small compromise. And to be quite honest, you should never have to adjust this potentiometer. Once it's set, it should never change. I mean, unless the computer's 40 years old, of course. So now I'm going to go ahead and and just trim that leg ever so slightly to get it to line up as best I can with the third leg of the potentiometer. Then I'm going to solder them together, make it one connection. All right, so let's see if we get a close up here and show you exactly what happened. Now you can see that third leg there, it's connected to the board. And everything should be just fine. So let's go ahead and plug the computer in and see if we can get this color adjusted out the way that it should be. As you can see, it's still kind of purple like we left it before. Not good. But let's go ahead and adjust the potentiometer and see what we have. And as you can see, as I turn the potentiometer and I change the resistance, it's dialing the circuit. I can actually go too far and turn it green, but I'm going to back it out just a little bit to where my eyes know the Atari 130XE should be at. That looks good, guys. That looks real good, actually. I think I'm going to leave it right there. I think we nailed it. So with that being said, let's go ahead and put the computer back together. And let's do a little testing. Enjoy the music while I put this back together.
All right, so for one final test, let's go ahead and pop a cartridge into the 130XE and actually see the results of the repair. We're going to go ahead and pop in Pac-Man, one of my favorite games to play on the Atari. And let's watch it work.